you look at the last five weeks, we have had five different cabinet members from India in the United States. It's a reflection of the depth and breadth of our relationship and the seriousness of it that you've had five cabinet officials in the United States over the last five weeks. I've been in journalism now nearly 30 years. And uh, the decade I actually started out, there'd been no U.S. president visiting India. Now that seems hard to believe. You look at the American tech companies, uh, a lot of them are headed by Indians. Uh, they're Americans, but look like Indians. If you go to Bangalore, I mean, there are at least, I believe, 70,000 American passport holders who live in uh, Bangalore, uh, most of them in the tech companies. So you have actually an extraordinary uh, binding that is taking place. The exchange between our people on this innovation and technology is really what's driving uh, our economies, but it's also what's driving the future towards clean energy and, and towards mitigating climate change. I would say the nuclear weapon testing actually helped or forced, to the action forcing event that compelled Delhi and Washington to take a fresh look at the whole structure of the technological relationship. You know, the, the fact is you cannot understate the value of the civil nuclear negotiations in changing the India-US relationship. And yet the irony is there is not a single American nuclear power plant in India. Today I see whether it is Russia, whether it is China, all of these are being decided on a political level first. And then it's a question of which camp you want to be comfortable in that is going to decide where you go. Now, India is in a, either in a very sweet spot because it is being allowed, if you like, by every side to, to play all sides. But is that sweet spot going to last? If Russia is an important partner for India, but Russia has been about India's past. I would say the U.S. is about India's future. I think we heard from a former foreign secretary once who said that uh, um, India and the U.S. have a lot in common as long as you're looking east. It's to the west of India that the problems begin. The U.S. policy to in South Asia at one point was Pakistan first. It was based on an alliance with Pakistan. Today, that alliance is, is no longer there in the same form. Today, you can say it is an India first policy in the region. The scale of this relationship does not compare to what exists between Pakistan and the US. But you can't expect the rest of the world will simply won't talk to Pakistan just because we don't like them. There are going to be stories that pop up of disagreements between the United States and India, and that's okay. We're at a point in our relationship, a mature relationship, where we can have these different disagreements. Thank you so much for coming. Um, in fact, I was surprised that our first session in the morning was full house, because usually in Delhi, the first session always is the sleepy one. Not many people turn up. So um, thank you for making the time. And uh, I hope over the next two days, you will get um, some wonderful insights from the many speakers we have. Uh, you have the introductions here in place. Uh, Mr. Pant, Harshvi Pant was supposed to join us, but he is uh, Last night got a high fever, so we wish him a speedy recovery. <clears throat> so let me uh, give you three minutes each, uh, and this uh, can be you know, whatever you think is appropriate, and then we'll come to the specifics that I have listed. We hear this cliche all the time, that you know the largest democracy and the oldest democracy, whenever there is any delegation visiting one way or the other. Uh, and it's nice, it sounds great, but realistically, uh, what are the areas of overlap that are low-hanging fruit where you do see uh, strategic alliances or regional cooperation? And uh, which are the more challenging areas which you think will be difficult to negotiate uh, as time goes on? Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, before I get into the question, I want to uh, speak about the title of today's event, which is U.S. and India at 75. Uh, it's an exciting year for India with the 75th anniversary of independence and for us at the mission a very exciting time uh, for our 75th anniversary of our relations as well. So we spent the last year looking back at the deep foundation over these 75 years, uh, going back to Prime Minister Nehru, his close relationship with President Eisenhower, uh, visits from Jimmy Carter, the impact that India had on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he visited uh, before he started his nonviolence movement for civil rights in the United States, and then the explosive growth over the last 20 years. And so when we talk about um, the opportunities, we are building on these 75 years uh, but there is still a lot of work to come. There are a lot of challenges. 
Um, and when we talk about these opportunities, it, I actually wouldn't say it's cliche to use that, that line <clears throat> on the world's largest and oldest democracies because it, it speaks to our shared values. Uh, we have shared values, shared interests, and a shared vision together. Uh, our shared values as democracies, uh, many of you in the press know the importance that both of our countries place on a free press, on free expression, on the institutions of democracies that we have in both of our countries, on our shared interests of seeking greater economic prosperity for both of our countries, and, and the huge growth in our economic relationship. Uh, it's doubled, our trade relationship has doubled in the last seven years. We're seeing huge growth there. And then in our shared vision, uh, we talk regionally, uh, we are now partners not just bilaterally and in multilateral institutions like the UN, but on specific organizations that we're creating together, like the Quad of US, India, Japan, and Australia, like I2U2 of US, India, Israel, and the UAE. Uh, we're building regional organizations to address the challenges coming in the future, and we have a shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific that we're both pursuing together. So um, I'm looking forward to talking more about the opportunities that we have, and, and I want to say that there will be challenges over the coming years as we try to both implement these new organizations that we're creating, uh, try to pursue our vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, and to work together on some of the challenges that we'll continue to see every day. There are, there are going to be stories that pop up of disagreements between the United States and India, and that's okay. We're at a point in our relationship, a mature relationship, where we can have these different disagreements, we can talk through them, and they'll continue to happen because there is room to grow in this relationship, and we're looking forward to building on these first 75 years. Thanks, Chris. So, Hassan, you've been covering um, foreign relations for a long time, and you've heard many presidents, delegations, prime ministers talk about it. Uh, where do you see this heading, and what has the progress been so far? Well, you know, it's all a question of what is the arc you're looking at. Um, I've been in journalism now nearly 30 years. And uh, the decade I actually started out, there'd been no U.S. president visiting India. Now that seems hard to believe because every U.S. president visits India. Um, one of my first assignments was to cover Hillary Clinton's visit to India. Uh, the reason I'm pointing that out is because we take a lot for granted in the India-U.S. relationship as if it is the most natural thing. Um, and for so many of us, uh, it, it is a no-brainer that uh, when we think about education, when we think about entertainment, when we think about uh, cultural uh, affinities, uh, and as Chris pointed out, when we think about uh, our shared values uh, or shared uh, beliefs in, uh, in the democratic system, in the importance of federalism, these are all things we share with the United States, and I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Year upon year, since 1998, which arguably was the low point after the nuclear explosions, um, the Indo-US relationship has grown. Um, but it grew at a time when it required two things. One was for India to stop, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, worrying about losing its non-aligned status. And it needed for the U.S. to have a much broader understanding from its traditional understanding of uh, cops and robbers, allies and enemies, you know, um, with us, without us, uh, kind of uh, uh, relationship with other countries in the world. Uh, so I think a little bit of both happened, and that's why the India-U.S. relationship grew as it did. But I do think we're reaching a point of inflection. We're reaching a point where the world is polarized, not because of India's fault or because perhaps of anything directly done by the United States, but the world has reached this position today, and I do think the Ukraine war is an inflection point in many ways, which will not just be wished away. It won't be one more area where India and the US don't see eye to eye. I think it will have repercussions, and we need to see that because it is in, it is in both countries' interests uh, to see a shared uh, vision, to see a growth together. So I do think that is one area where I'm seeing a shift um, uh, backwards. Uh, and, and I can explain that in, in greater lengths because I used to be able to think there was a world uh, which believed in what was called the a la carte option. 
I'll take this part of my relationship from you. I'll buy this from you. I'll send my students to your country uh, and that sort of thing. More and more, if the world gets polarized, if it gets uh, broken into areas that agree or disagree with the war or areas that agree or disagree with sanctions or areas that decide that your economic interests must lie along with your political interests, uh, you are going to see what is seen as the buffet option. You either take this entire buffet of things or you take that buffet of things. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's going to be one more area of concern. And finally, I think India's own relationship with its democracy and the US's own relationship with its democracy is going to decide a lot of the bilateral relationship. Why do I say that? Um, there is a certain uh, uh, relationship the U.S. government had with its democracy during the previous era, the Trump administration. Uh, we see in India a certain relationship between the government uh, and democracy where they are trying to redefine, if you like, democracy. Democracy is seen much more as a, about a majority wanting certain things. Uh, if that relationship uh, is not at the same page, if both sides don't have similar relations with their democracies. Um, I, and I'm happy to explain that further. I, I do think that's going to be another point of inflection. And finally, I would like to say that not having a US ambassador in India for the last two years uh, is either a good sign or a bad sign. It's a, it's a bad sign if you think about the idea that the US has not been able to send an ambassador uh, here for the daily relationship uh, to grow. Um, but on the other hand, relations are pretty good despite the fact that there hasn't been one. Thank you. How about you, Raj Mohan? Yeah, I think uh, if you take the last 75 years, I mean, one theme which has become more and more important uh, is, the, is the question of technology. You know, for your generation, I mean, you look at the American tech companies, uh, a lot of them are headed by Indians. Uh, they're Americans, but look like Indians. And if you go to Bangalore, uh, you'll find, uh, you can't make out, I mean, there are at least, I believe, 70,000 American passport holders who live in uh, Bangalore, uh, most of them in the tech companies. So you have actually an extraordinary uh, binding that has taken place uh, on the technology front uh, between uh, the US and India, Silicon Valley and Bangalore. Uh, you see, uh, it's not just, an, you know, a, a curiosity because today the future of economy is largely on the technological front, on the innovation front. And this is one area where you see the, the India and the US actually, uh, uh, you know, are getting together so, so closely. But this was not always the case. Uh, if you go back to the 50s, uh, in fact, uh, the first Indian reactor was an American one. Uh, the first Indian satellite was an American one. Uh, the, those of you, uh, you know, India's Green Revolution, uh, initiated by the so-called uh, agricultural universities, uh, which were really built with American assistance, uh, the land-grant universities. America had a model where the American uh, model was adopted in India, and the agricultural extension was all done on that model. So you had in the 50s and the early 60s who so saw a dramatic expansion of technological cooperation between India and the U.S., but then it all fell apart in the 70s and the 80s uh, after India's nuclear test in 1974, the non-proliferation regime, and then you had U.S. sanctions on India. So you had a period of, uh, you know, in the 70s and right up to the, to the 80s uh, where the tensions began to mount. Uh, and in the early 90s, they really peaked uh, when India tested again the nuclear weapons in 1998. Uh, the story after that, was really, I would say, the nuclear weapons testing actually helped or forced, it was an action forcing event that compelled Delhi and Washington to take a fresh look at the whole structure of the technological relationship. And that's when we had the civil nuclear deal uh, in 2005. Many of the sanctions against India were lifted uh, and now you have actually an, an expansive cooperation. And it's not just a, a G to G, that is a government to government enterprise, though there is a lot of that but it's really uh, company to company, B2B. There are more and more businesses today, Indian businesses, American businesses, are deeply tied on the, on the technological front. So I think we are just at the beginning of this process. Uh, this, I think, is going to acquire uh, even a bigger dimension in the coming years for two reasons. I mean, one, as I said, uh, economic growth is today tied to technological innovation. 
and is no longer just the traditional factors of production, which was uh, you know land, labor, and capital. Uh, today, it's a technology as a critical factor in shaping not only national economies but also the international economy and the balance of power uh, between our different countries. Those of you who saw the U.S. National Security Strategy document that was issued yesterday, and a few days before that, uh, the U.S. had passed a Chips Act uh, on semiconductors and has imposed a series of uh, sanctions or measures against the Chinese uh, semiconductor manufacturing. So you have actually the technology and geopolitics today have come together, where the conflict between U.S. and China uh, is becoming the central feature of the global politics, and there. The question of technology, whether the U.S. can maintain its lead in the advanced technologies from artificial intelligence or semiconductors or a range of these areas, uh, that has become a critical concern for the U.S. Happily for India and the U.S. at this point, our interests are in convergence, uh, that India and U.S. see each other as trusted partners. So if you're going to build new resilient supply chains, if you're going to build new partnerships in technology, uh, I think we're just going to see we're on the cusp of something uh, really substantive and transformative in the technological cooperation. And I would say uh, this, more than anything else, will have the biggest effect on the relationship. Uh, while all the, we have a lot of problems, I mean, uh, on, on a range of issues from trade, because trade Americans fight with everyone and everyone fights with the Americans, but that's not a <laughs> big deal. Uh, on, on issues of democracy, on the question of uh, how we think about the region, a whole lot of issues, there will be differences. But it is the technological cooperation which is driving economic cooperation. As I said, U.S. is uh, today the most comprehensive economic partner for India. And I think the technological element of that will continue to grow. And my sense is uh, it's going to be really uh, the, the key factor. And here I would just conclude. I come from Andhra Pradesh, you know, Andhra and Telangana. Uh, everyone in Andhra Pradesh and their brother wants to do engineering. There are more engineering colleges in Andhra Pradesh than anywhere else probably in the world. And all of them go to something called the Visa Temple in Hyderabad, next to the American consulate. So there is a Visa Temple. They go there, they pray to the Lord before they appear before the American consulate uh, that they would get the visa. And today, my country cousins are the largest component of the Indian community in the United States, and most of them in Silicon Valley. You want the best in Andhra food? Go to Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of visa lines, I remember uh, this is uh, in the early 2000s when I was going for my visa interview with my beard and my baton suit. The guy behind me in line said, really want to go like that? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, uh, thank you for touching on technology because actually my next question was kind of hinged on technology and not the internet tech space, but uh, we were just discussing the Inflation Reduction Act, which has a huge uh, component of green tech, green energy, and the move to green. Uh, we saw yesterday, was it yesterday or day before that India abstained from the condemnation of Russia uh, that, that was proposed at the UN. A lot of um, strategic alliances and relationships are being determined by this conflict that no one has foreseen, had foreseen. And like Suhasini said, there may be shared values, just like uh, you know Nelson Mandela had you know, shared values with the US, but I remember that one speech of his where he said, why should I not make friends with uh, Fidel Castro or... or uh, uh, others who, who were enemies. So do you see while the need for that was domestic politics to you know get uh, some sort of a, a infrastructure development and, and job creation domestically, could that in the future and how close in the future impact strategic alliances because dependence on fossil fuels more than anything I think determines you know, strategic partnerships. You think there is any scope of that being fast enough or do countries like India have to go through a fossil fuel fueled boom before we can get to the stage where our strategic alliances can be completely independent of uh, those considerations? Yes, yeah, so there, there are a whole number of topics in that, a bunch of different threads. Uh, I think the one thing that sort of ties it all together is that if we're talking about energy, we're talking about energy prices, uh, the concern right now in the world is because of Russia's brutal war of aggression on Ukraine, uh, preventing some of the typical exports that you're coming from the region and disrupting the energy markets. And so that has led to uh, thinking 
uh, about how do we transition past fossil fuels. But this is a conversation that's been going on for years, decades really, and, and actually an area of good cooperation between the United States and India. Um, in fact, uh, just last week, um, Energy uh, Minister Puri was in the United States uh, meeting with the U.S. Secretary of Energy Granholm uh, to talk about clean energy. Uh, we have the U.S.-India uh, Strategic Clean Energy Partnership. Uh, we have a uh, clean energy vision that we share for 2030, Climate and Clean Energy Vision 2030. Um, and so these are conversations that are happening at a high level between our countries. Uh, and the United States is, is proud to be a member of the International Solar Alliance, uh, which India has a leadership role in. Um, and so our countries are working together at a very high level on transitioning from fossil fuels. Um, and in the United States, it's not just happening at the highest levels, but it's happening at the state levels. Uh, you saw a recent announcement by California uh, that they will no longer allow new sales of gasoline-powered cars by 2035. New York adopted that. So even at the state level, you see that. And then at, at, at sort of the, the micro level between our countries, uh, we're working together on dealing with clean energy and climate change as well. Uh, we have a, uh, a center here in New Delhi, uh, some of you might know, called Nexus. Uh, it's a startup incubator uh, that the U.S. government funds. Uh, and we've been focusing a lot on clean energy and on climate change in some of these uh, innovative entrepreneurs that are coming to the center. Um, and a few of these indigenous companies uh, in India, um, uh, Daraksha, um, Ecovia, they, they've come up with uh, ways to turn waste into packaging, sustainable packaging. Uh, another company that's come out of our Nexus Center called Rix, uh, like bricks with a W, because they come up with bricks made out of waste. Um, and so you see this innovation happening at the micro level, you see the collaboration happening at the highest levels. Um, and uh, to see Roger Mohan's point, uh, the exchange between our people on this innovation and technology is really what's driving uh, our economies, but it's also what's driving the future towards clean energy and, and towards mitigating climate change. So uh, there's a lot happening between the United States and India that's helping move the world past fossil fuels and into a, a cleaner future. So Hassani, um, this whole um, Russia vote has uh, demonstrated fault lines between you know, assumed allies in the last few months. Uh, one is, of course, how realistic is um, the non-dependence on fossil fuels and therefore decisions being taken by countries uh, which are independent of that consideration. And B, when it comes to defense cooperation, that is one of the biggest grouses India's had for a while. Uh, have you seen any change? Uh, have you seen uh, the, the way this conversation goes forward between delegations change uh, in the last few years since you've been reporting this? No, certainly. I mean, the, the entire trend has shifted in the last decade. If a decade ago, India was 90% dependent on one country, uh, which was Russia, it's much less now. It's about 60 to 70% for its defense hardware. Um, when it comes uh, to oil, that's a completely different uh, issue because it's a, it's a very strange uh, situation where uh, uh, India is taking oil from a country which has never been one of its big oil suppliers. Uh, you know, Russia wasn't, I think, even in the top 15 suppliers to India before. Now it's number two. Um, so, uh, you know, so, it, it, uh, and this is just because of the war and, and what has followed. Um, but to come back to the India-US equation, yes, it's all increased. All, you know, there's, there's no question that there's a shift, that India is now, uh, in terms of annual uh, defense hardware, and this is not exactly my subject, but I think it's over $20 billion in the year. Um, of not not on an annual basis, but yes, uh, just, cumulatively okay. over twenty billion. Um, but but uh, and it's you know you're not seeing the same leaps with anyone else. But I think we have to also take a, a slightly larger view of what this is. It's about the philosophy. It's about the philosophy of cooperation. Where that comes from. Earlier this week, we heard from External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar in Australia when asked, "Is India rethinking its relationship with Russia, particularly on hardware?" His answer was, "Our relationship with Russia stems from the." period of the Soviet Union when uh, Western countries weren't willing to share their hardware with them. Today I will say Western countries are willing to share their hardware, but we're not yet seeing transfer of technology uh, move as much. Uh, so when you look in two, three areas, you are seeing, for example, 
the transfer of technology for the moment is all still coming from that one uh, supplier. Uh, then you look at India's future exports of defense. What, are its, what is its brightest star, if you like, that has been talked about a lot in the last few years? It's Brahmos. Brahmos literally stands for Brahmaputra Moskva. Um, and uh, uh, when India sells it, it also needs uh, uh, you know, Russian support for it. Um, when you look at the nuclear uh, deal, uh, the civil nuclear deal that uh, 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 Professor Rajamohan spoke about, and you know, the, the fact is you cannot understate the value of the civil nuclear negotiations in changing the India-US relationship. The way India and the US worked together on that changed everything. And yet, the irony is, as of today, and we're talking 2022, 14 years after the first MOU was signed um, between India and the US, there is not a single American nuclear power plant in India. There is not even the groundbreaking for a nuclear, an American nuclear power plant in India. In fact, there isn't a single non-Russian foreign nuclear power plant in India. Now, that might change in the next few years. France is certainly ahead in the game as well. I'm just making the point that these things take time. Uh, and while uh, some countries have the luxury of waiting, India is a country that's growing so fast, it doesn't have that luxury. So it's taking what it can, where it can, when it can. Uh, and that is going to have, as I said, up till now there was an understanding or uh, uh, you know, a kind of global uh, assurance that these political issues between countries would not change the economics, would not change the supply chains. Today, I don't see that. Today, I see whether it is Russia, whether it is China, all of these are being decided uh, on a political level first. And then it's a question of which camp you want to be comfortable in that is going to decide where you go. Now, India is in a, either in a very sweet spot because it is being allowed, if you like, by every side to, to play all sides. But is that sweet spot going to last as the world grows more polarized? And when this war ends, because this war will end one way or the other, uh, those are the tough choices I think we see ahead of us. And those will also bleed into the, the, the nature of the India-US relationship. Uh, Professor Rajmohan, actually, I wanted to, we may not have the time, but one of the subjects I want to touch on was uh, the visa regime and uh, you know the students that go and uh, can we expect a larger quota for India? Uh, but so, I mean, if you want to weigh in on that, uh, but because we do want to take some questions from the crowd, I'm sorry, we're running a little behind schedule, so we won't be able to delve into that in as much depth as I would have liked. But if you would like to weigh in on that, uh, other than the d defense cooperation or strategic alliances yeah. led by that. On defense cooperation, I mean, India doesn't export much, but the largest destination for Indian arms exports is the United States. Uh, because I think while Brahmos is a, is a, is a case that's out there, we, we just sold the first one. I mean, uh, but the exports are taking place, for example, Tata and the Lockheed work together, the Tata and Boeing work together, the software companies in Bangalore export to American defense companies. So, so there's actually a different kind of defense relationship is emerging. Uh, on the technology question, I think uh, unlike Russia uh, or France, the, in the US, it is not a G2G business. I mean, the American president can't tell Boeing just go and give this technology to Indians. We love the Indians. I mean, so there, I think that's what the Chinese figured out. And that's how they negotiated with the companies. Give them access to the market and extract something from the US companies. That was a Chinese strategy. But in India, the focus is mostly on give me the technology. But, but I think it is happening organically, both on the defense side as well as on the other side. And my sense is we're going to see more of that. On energy, the US again has become a leading supplier of energy to India. Uh, because of the natural gas exports. Uh, so unlike many, we, they're exporting country today. So I think there again, a new relationship. On the green issue, I think people didn't invest in the traditional fossil fuels. Uh, and therefore they thought we were already jumping into the green side. And suddenly this crisis has forced everyone to look at it. But my sense is this will be a temporary one. But long term, it is on the green. But in the near term, you have to find solutions to the, to the, to the energy crisis. But I'll just conclude with Putin's recent speech. But he said, look, all this you know, tech companies, all these digital valuations is all bullshit. Real stuff is energy. You, know? you can't work without energy. Therefore, I've got the bigger weapon. But the point is, I think uh, the rest of the system is getting together, finding alternatives. We'll see in the next few months whether Europe can survive this winter. So my sense is we are going to move beyond 
natural resource based economies to one focus on technology and that brings me back to the original point where i think if russia is an important partner for india but russia has been about india's past i would say the us is about india's future right uh, so we'll take questions now uh, i have a couple of requests you could just identify yourself when you ask your question uh, please ensure it is indeed a question and not a very long observation because we have lots of that here as well uh, and also uh, the media rumble is often told we don't have enough sessions on climate change and we have spoken about that so there is a session on why climate change is missing from newsrooms so i urge you to attend that that promises to be very interesting so okay we can start with a question here and then uh, we can go back there and then come here again uh, uh, michael just come to you uh, you could just identify yourself and who your question is aimed at hello ma'am hello sirs my name is meher and i am a student of masters from jamia millia so sir my question is actually directed to all of you so the question is that despite uh, india us relationship improving on all aspects is there a persistent tension between the us's expectation of india as an ally in indo pacific and india's uh, india's persistent uh, demand of india being given the role of primary decision maker in indo pacific especially the indo part of indo pacific so what are the insights on this so how Thank realistic you. is that expectation Uh, so Ashwin, you want to take a stab at that first? I I think it's interesting because um, you know India has is the only member of the Quad that is not an ally in some shape or form. Uh, Japan has uh, at least the U.S. has a treaty with Japan, uh, uh, and uh, Australia and uh, the U.S. have an alliance. So India is the only one that is not an ally. So it is going to bring a different complexion to this uh, policy. the idea that the us wanted to move away from pacific to indo pacific they changed the name of their military command um it means that they they see a value for india to be a part uh, of this region and certainly as a uh, as a net security provider in the indian ocean region india takes uh, a large role but when you ask that question about being constrained i have to say that last week you know we saw a uh, us australia japan trilateral taking place and they came out with this joint statement that you know sort of came full guns blazing at everyone russia china naming people you know saying very direct stuff and i thought my god you know you just add india to this mix and straight away you see these lines where you have to read you know one word will be extra and people <laughs> will say my god we agreed on this so there's no question that india is in a sense holding back the strategic uh, implications of this indo pacific strategy Okay. Okay, why don't you go ahead? Sorry young man, I'll just come to you after we'll come up here. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mayank. So, I wanted to ask sir how US media see India when it comes to the matter pertaining to them. Like uh, recently they said ki uh, Modi's statement the US media quoted Modi's statement it is not time to for, uh, for war. When it comes to Delhi rights, they have different perspective or uh, for say views and when it comes to their personal interest uh, so there is something of difference I see. So, what is your take on it? thanks right uh, the, we have one media professional because uh, unlike in india the media there isn't really run by the government <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know whether chris can i beg to defer <laughs> i beg to defer there are exceptions yeah of course the, 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 uh, yeah of course that's why you're here but chris <laughs> you have any view on that yeah sure i mean uh, as i was saying earlier both of our countries have a uh, strong uh, media institutions uh, a, a very wide ranging press the united states likes to think we have a very wide ranging press but then you come to india and you see the number of languages mediums parts of the country different political views the number of political parties that are covered um it, there's there's just no comparison just how broad and vast this media environment is um and it, i think that uh in in terms of how the united states media views uh india uh you see india mentioned more and more and more in india in uh, in american news and it it's both a reflection of the foreign media's interest in india and the us media's interest in india but also just americans interest in india we've talked about the tech relationships uh we've talked about our growing partnership uh the united states uh, although we're not necessarily allies from the defense side we're major defense partners um the indian defense attache has free uh, access unescorted access to our pentagon one of the most secure buildings 
things in the world. We let the Indian defense attache just walk right in. And it's because of the level of trust and growth. Um, and that's not just from the US media viewing India, it's a reflection of the relationship. And it's on the government side, on the business side, uh, and then you know, on the student side, uh, we, we just issued a record 82,000 visas to Indians this year, the most ever, uh, the most of any country. We've got 200,000 Indian students and uh, 4 million Indian Americans in the U.S. And, and so the interest from the U.S. media in India is, is a reflection of the increasing interest uh, of not just our government, uh, but our economies and our people as well. Um, yes, please go ahead. So America happens to be India's one of the largest trading partners and also one of the largest source of foreign investments. But as some resources suggest that the Ukraine war, it has acted as a stress level for the diplomatic ties of both the countries. Now, if the assessment is correct, so how has both the countries performed regarding that? Look, I think Ukraine is a problem, but it is not such a big problem, you know, between India and the US. I mean, my, my sense is there's a lot of heartburn that India is not voting with the US, but at the same time, the U.S. administration has cut a lot of slack for India. Uh, they're not making it a test case for the bilateral relationship. So it's not uh, made, a, made a huge difference because as we were talking about the Indo-Pacific on the Quad, I mean, there's a lot of cooperation between India and the U.S. So, so I don't think Ukraine is an issue, but it's not such a big issue that will break the relationship. Look, I think we are not the only ones. I mean, <laughs> it's, look, at, look at, I think India is not America's problem in Ukraine. You have Turkey, which is a NATO member, is playing all sides. Mm. Uh, you have Germany, which is totally tied to the Russian gas. Uh, you have the French minister, uh, foreign minister yesterday said, look, Russia is our neighbor. We need to live with them. Maybe part of the deal is to give Ukrainian territory away. I don't think Ukrainians will buy into that. So Europe itself is divided. That is the real issue for them. Not where is in, look, UN, we take in, UN too seriously in this country. I mean, that's okay. It's an interesting place. A lot of people vote, but it is not the strategic place where actually things are being decided. My sense is uh, real problems because the war is in Europe and Europe is divided, divided deeply on how to deal with the Russian question. And that is where the problems are going to be for the US. And I think we don't create any trouble for the Americans I think, at this point on, on Ukraine. So that's any, Chris. Hmm? I, if just one thing to add, it's sort of been alluded to a few times, how is the U.S.-India relationship going to survive Ukraine? And I, I think you got to a lot of the points, but I, I think you should ask the Indian government you look at the last five weeks, we have had five different cabinet members from India in the United States. You had the commerce minister, you had the finance minister right now, uh, S&T minister, we talked about the energy minister, uh, Minister Jai Shankar spent 10 days in the United States. Um, it's a reflection of the depth and breadth of our relationship and the seriousness of it that you've had five cabinet officials in the United States over the last five weeks. This is, this is, and this is ongoing as of today. So it, it's, 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 it's something where we don't necessarily see 100% eye to eye, um, but you know, as, as, as Roger Mohan said, it, it's, it's not a litmus test. It, it, is, it is a discussion that we're having. It's an ongoing discussion between our governments. Right, go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, this is Adhyat Marma here. I'm from um, Indra Prasad University, WIPS College. Uh, I do have a question regarding, uh, we, we have uh, two neighboring countries which have an uh, expensive theory of taking up the borders, right? So when we talk about China specifically, we have several Vajra Pahar and all those kind of uh, defense military exercises going on in the high range altitudes. But when we look at to the opposite side, for, uh, opposite side of our country, which is Pakistan. So what do we see as from the US taking the action to uh, hold the uh, border, uh, uh, I would say, border, taking up the borders? Uh, by the U.S., what what U.S. sees as from like what what kind of military exercises we can do uh, to prevent that from the other side also? Yeah, this is I guess the oldest question of of Indo-Pak relations and where U.S. stands. This this has been on. Yeah, uh, I, have I, you I, seen a change at all, Suhasini? Yeah, I, th I think we heard from a former foreign secretary once who said that uh, um, India and the U.S. have a lot in common as long as you're looking east. It's to the west of India that the problems begin. And, and, and you know, that's a fair fact. And to give the US credit over the last 20 years, they've tried a lot of things. They've tried the dehyphenation. They've tried the completely hiving off, you know, what they call the SRAP 
um, a desk which was, you know, only looking at Afghanistan, Pakistan, and therefore, uh, you know, not looking at India in the same. They've tried the idea of um, visits to India not being tied with visits to Pakistan, uh, all the rest. But it comes back. I mean, just this month, uh, what we have seen, and uh, you're absolutely right, we've had a lot of uh, visits. Uh, but uh, as far as the external affairs minister's visit to the U.S. went, it was overshadowed by this idea of the U.S. choosing just this moment to uh, um, uh, to give this aid package, uh, what is it, support package on F-16s uh, to Pakistan. So that's going to, uh, you know, that's always going to be an issue because not all all my enemies are going to be your enemies and not all my friends are your friends, obviously. Um, but I think in there, there is the kernel of truth. You know, th that is it, that countries are going to get on because they have something in common or that they have something to give each other. If you get into this mentality of me and my friends versus my enemies and their friends, you are never going to be able to, you know, uh, sort of develop relations with half the world. Um, and that's why India's position of saying that it is not going to take sides does work. The only problem is then India has to be willing for others also to say, I'm not going to take sides. Or why don't you let the UN sort this problem out between you, um, which obviously doesn't go down very well in Delhi. Look, I think we should stop being obsessing with Pakistan. We are, <laughs> you know, our economy today is at $3.5 trillion. Pakistan is barely at $330 billion. And the US policy to in South Asia at one point was Pakistan first. It was based on an alliance with Pakistan. Today that alliance is, is no longer there in the same form. Today you can say it is an India first policy in the region where the volume of Indian trade, technological cooperation, uh, flow of people, the Indian diaspora, the scale of this relationship does not compare to what exists between Pakistan and the US. But you can't expect the rest of the world will simply won't talk to Pakistan just because we don't like them. It's still, you know, the fourth largest country in the world. Uh, it has nuclear weapons. It has a large army. So people are going to engage with Pakistan. The question is, is it posing a fundamental threat to you today? I think we have passed that phase. Uh, we're no longer in that phase. So therefore, uh, we are negotiating with Pakistan ourselves. Even last year, we had a ceasefire agreement. It is a problem we will solve. We have to solve. Nobody else is going to solve it for us. So, so I think, uh, as we've seen with Bangladesh, we've settled some problems. Eventually, someday, we'll do the same with Pakistan. So we don't have to bring outsiders uh, into that. On the question of social justice in India, look, no foreign government is going to do social justice in India. It is our job. It is our democracy's job. The idea that a foreigner will come and gift democracy to any other country is a fundamentally mistaken. We've seen that in Afghanistan. We've seen that in Iraq. We have to fight for our rights. So it is not a foreign government. As I said, democracy is not a foreigner's gift. It is something we have to build ourselves. So therefore, don't bring in that set of issues. Yeah. That is, we must build our own society in what we think, our constitutional rights and our constitutional means, rather than expecting someone else will take care of our minorities. We can't take care of American minorities, nor America can take care of Indian minorities. So I think it is our task, our political task, our democratic task, not it does not belong to the realm of foreign policy. Right. You want to add? Yeah, not not a ton to add. I, I think uh, on, on the India uh, and Pakistan relationship, it, it, it was discussed. But from the U.S. perspective, uh, we have a U.S.-Pakistan relationship. We have a U.S.-India relationship. We have different interests. We have different uh, shared values with each country. Um, but we don't see either country through the lens of the other. We have independent relationships, and, and I, I would hope that uh, those in the crowd today appreciate that the U.S. views India through the U.S.-India relationship and through no other country. Um, and on social justice, uh, you can see the news as well as I can in the United States that this is an ongoing conversation that's happening around the United States. Uh, is something where we have protests, we have debates, uh, we have um, uh, legislation being drafted, um, and just on a personal level, uh, we're having these conversations individually on what does diversity and equity and inclusion mean in the United States? What does social justice mean? How do we provide space for everyone in our country? And these conversations in a democracy happen out in the open, uh, and we're happy to have those out in the open because we recognize that uh, we are always striving for what we call a more perfect union, and we will always keep working for that and, and we continue to defend human rights uh, around the world uh, just as we're trying to improve human rights in the United States.
And in fact, to that question, I uh, would recommend the book. I, I mean, in respect of what you think of her career as a as a diplomat, uh, Samantha Powers' book, um, The Training of an Idealist, I think it's called. And you see how her view changed as a student and a war correspondent uh, when she was covering uh, the war and the moral ambiguity of when you take decisions as a correspondent that how dare my country not intervene and then, you know, when, when you're in the position to intervene, the position changes a little bit. And I always use this platform to urge everybody to subscribe to News Laundry and pay to keep news free because when you have a captive audience, you must plug your product. <laughs> so pay to keep news free because <laughs> we don't depend on advertising uh, and I think news needs subscriptions. Uh, Hindu also has subscriptions, so go to the Hindu and subscribe to them because the more you, uh, and to, to this young man's point, the more uh, news which is one of the pillars of democracy depends on you directly rather than uh, large advertisers, whether it be uh, corporations or governments, the more robust a democracy will be. So do your bit, and then hopefully the government will do theirs. Thank you, Suhasini. Thank you, Professor Rajmohan. Thank you, Chris. And thank you all. Thank you.